we'll have a few words from Dr. Kiernan. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I was reading yesterday uh, in an excellent book called France on the Mekong, which is about the colonial history of Cambodia, uh, which stops in 1954 when the French left Cambodia. By that time, a man named Nguyen Chia had joined the communist movement in Cambodia, and he only features very short, shortly, briefly in this book. But in a footnote towards the end of this uh, excellent book, which was written in 2002, uh, the author writes, at the time of writing, Nguyen Chia, now 76 years old, still lives in the former Khmer Rouge stronghold of Pai Lin in Western Cambodia. It seems unlikely that he will ever face trial for his part in the brutality of democratic Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge regime. At that time, it wasn't clear that there would ever be a tribunal set up to bring to justice the leaders of the Pol Pot regime. Nguyen Chia was, in fact, the deputy party secretary of the Communist Party of Cambodia, deputy to Pol Pot, who had died four years before in 1998. And it seems, uh, seemed quite clear at the time to this author, John Tully, in this excellent book, that uh, it was unlikely that Nguyen Chia or any of the other Khmer Rouge leaders who had been defeated but were still living freely uh, would ever be brought to trial. But indeed, Nguyen Chia was brought to trial. He had surrendered and he was under the control of the Cambodian government. And the United Nations had begun a, a, a program of negotiations with the Cambodian government to set up a tribunal which was eventually established in 2006, just four years after this book was written. And uh, in uh, around 2009, Nguyen Chia was arrested uh, and he spent the next 10 years in jail. Uh, he was tr uh, charged uh, and tried for crimes against humanity, for which he was found guilty in 2014. Uh, he appealed, and the appeal uh, was denied uh, in 2016, so he remained in jail. He was then tried for genocide, and in 2018, he was found guilty of two counts of genocide against the Cambodian uh, Muslim minority, the Cham people, and also against the ethnic Vietnamese minority in Cambodia. Uh, his uh, colleague in the Cambodian regime of Pol Pot, Kyusen Pong, uh, was also arrested about the same time and was also found guilty of crimes against humanity and genocide, and he remains in jail, uh, having been convicted and sentenced to life, like Nguyen Chia for crimes against humanity, and his appeal against his genocide conviction is uh, continuing. Nguyen Chia died this August, uh, and uh, his appeal uh, was never held, never completed. Uh, but my point in this story is to show that the institutions that have been established around the world for the prevention, but particularly in this case for the punishment of genocide, have outlasted those two individuals and, and that they did come to fruition in this case. This was very late justice. Uh, the Khmer Rouge genocide ended in 1979. So it was 40 years before uh, Nguyen Chia and Kusen Han were convicted of genocide. And it was 30 years before they were arrested. But the uh, slow justice is better than no justice, although it's also true that uh, justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, it took uh, a number of, uh, of years before uh, the case for genocide was developed and brought through 
the United Nations uh, and before the United Nations. Only in 1999, after Pol Pot's death, did it get uh, the attention of the United Nations uh, General Assembly. Not the Security Council, because as you probably know, China said after the Rwanda genocide tribunal was established and the Bosnia tribunal was established, that it would never vote again for such an ad hoc tribunal through the Security Council. So it had to be the General Assembly, which negotiated, the Secretary General's representative negotiated with the Cambodian government. Certain compromises were made. Only the most senior leaders were going to be tried, uh, along with certain other people most responsible, including Duke, the commandant of the S-21 prison where possibly 16,000 people were murdered in Phnom Penh during the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, and so those three people have been tried and convicted. Uh, Yang Sari, Pol Pot's brother-in-law and deputy prime minister, was also prosecuted and tried for crimes against humanity, but he died during the trial. He was also scheduled to be tried for genocide, but he died in jail during the trial. His wife, who was also a minister in the Pol Pot cabinet, was arrested too, charged, uh, but then she was found mentally unfit to face trial and she was released. Uh, the leader of the Pol Pot regime's army, uh, Mok, uh, he was arrested and was set to face prosecution, but he died in jail. So um, my point really is that some justice has been achieved in Cambodia. Uh, a number of killers have got away, but a number of others have served time in re-education camps. The main people who got away were Pol Pot, who died in his sleep in 1998, and another commander, Kate Polk, who seems to have been pardoned by the Cambodian government for leading a revolt against Pol Pot much later. Uh, but apart from those two big fish, most of the other big fish have uh, Six, that have been prosecuted and, and, and at least served time in jail, uh, even if they weren't convicted uh, because of uh, death during their trials. The institutions that were established in 1948 with the Genocide Convention uh, have led to uh, the wheels of justice moving around the world. The first case of a genocide conviction was in 1994, in the case of Rwanda. And when the United Nations, with the support of uh, the United States in uh, 1996, 97, uh, got going on the Cambodian case and uh, joined by the Cambodian government with some severe compromises made. But these institutions and structures that were established did eventually produce results. No matter what Nguyen Chia and Kusum Pollock thought, or no matter what uh, scholars thought might happen. Uh, and it's important to uh, recognize that uh, the people who worked on those institutions have been rewarded. And I think if you look at the case of the Rohingya, where Azim has been uh, so active uh, over the years, where Things look rather uh, hopeless at times for the, for the future of the Rohingya people and bringing the perpetrators of crimes to justice. That there are structures and institutions around the world which can be uh, implemented to, to stop the mass killing and to bring the, the perpetrators uh, to justice. Just uh, a couple of words about the field of genocide studies and what is relatively, a relatively a new field. Of course, the most serious and most horrifying event in world history is quite possibly the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews. And some of the biggest contributors to our knowledge of uh, genocide have been the scholars who have worked on the Holocaust and have detailed the terrifying uh, crimes that were committed by the Nazis against the Jews. But it's not the only 
case of mass murder against an ethnic group. The uh, person who coined the term genocide, Raphael Lemkin, uh, was already before the Holocaust in the 1930s working on uh, the international recognition, he hoped, for the Armenian genocide in World War I. And it's the uh, work that was done by Raphael Lemkin and others since 1945 uh, to make comparisons and to see the similarities between the Holocaust and other genocides that have uh, proliferated despite the Genocide Convention coming into force in 1950. This has been the achievements of the field of genocide studies to, to show the importance of the Holocaust as the most extreme, if not unique, genocide, but it's still, uh, but still to show uh, the the crimes that have, of genocide that have been committed against other victims. And this is an extremely important development, I think, to show that there are similarities as well as differences between the Holocaust and other genocides. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, it came <coughs> to the notice of the prosecutors, of the Japanese imperialists, World War II, that uh, on the island of Borneo, in the former British colony of North Borneo, a revolt had taken place against Japanese rule uh, in the town of Cheselton, which is now Kota Kinabalu in Malaysia. And the ethnic Chinese had revolted there and killed 40 Japanese soldiers. And the Japanese had repressed that revolt and tried to kill as a result of all of the ethnic Chinese in the town, uh, which they proceeded to do during World War II. And then they found out a bit later that an ethnic uh, group of uh, people related to the Malays, the Suluk people, living on islands just offshore, had helped the ethnic Chinese. And so what they did was they went out to the islands and tried to kill everybody of the Suluk ethnic group, which they succeeded in doing. Only a few survivors of that entire ethnic group of the Suluk people uh, managed to escape. And this, this was investigated by British uh, lawyers for the Tokyo Tribunal after the war. And one lawyer wrote at the time, I'm not sure if it was before 1948 when the genocide convention was adopted, or slightly afterwards. I suspect it might have been before, because what he wrote was that this massacre of the near entire population of the Sulu people cannot be considered genocide, he said, because the Japanese did this against a number of other people as well. In other words, it was indiscriminate genocide. It was not singling out the Suluks because they did it to the Chinese in Jesselton just before that, and they did it to some islands in the Indian Ocean, the Andaman Islands. In other words, that there was not a singling out of the Suluk people. In other words, the, the idea that this British lawyer had was that it was impossible to commit more than one genocide. And I think we need to deal with that. We need to confront that possibility that a genocide perpetrator may have in mind destruction of more than one ethnic group, which has certainly been found in the case of Cambodia under Pol Pot. And a genocide perpetrator may not stop at one genocide or a destruction of one ethnic group. And the, the structure of the genocidal mind and the nature of the planning of a genocide may lead to multiple genocides, uh, which is a possibility we need to bear in mind. And I don't think it's at all precluded by the Genocide Convention and, and its language. Uh, these are just some thoughts for consideration. Thank you very much. Commence with panel one, and uh, Dr. Don Simi is the moderator of the panel, so just give us a moment to organize ourselves.
So to me again, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, the term genocide was coined in 1943, and as international law, the United Nations Genocide Convention of 1948 came into force in 1950. But it then took, as I mentioned, until 1998 for the first perpetrator of a genocide to be convicted in an international trial for a crime committed in Rwanda in 1994. But it's nevertheless widely acknowledged that the Nazi regime had committed genocide against Jews during World War II, even though that crime itself had no legal status at the time. And the Nazi defendants at Nuremberg were initially charged with genocide, even though there was no such crime at the time. But they were convicted of other crimes, as we all know. Genocide is often considered a 20th century crime, rather than a post-war legalism. And Polish jurist Raphael Lemkin considered the Armenian Genocide during World War I to be a similar crime, as I mentioned. So genocide before 1939, or even before 1900, was not at all unthinkable, but rather was expressed using different terminology. And of course it was conducted in different ways, depending on different historical, demographic, and environmental circumstances, as well as under earlier technological and organizational limitations. And there are various definitions of genocide, both legal and sociological. We've heard from Asim Ibrahim how the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide defines that crime. Any of the following acts, committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, and the acts are killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and finally, forcing, forcibly tra transferring children of the group to another group. I'd like to make three points here. First, note that the legal definition of genocide requires acts. Omissions or refusals to act cannot be considered genocidal. Thus, for instance, withholding food aid from a starving population in a neighboring country would not in itself be genocidal. Though perhaps cutting off, deliberately ending an existing aid program might be judged an act rather than omission. Second, the legal definition focuses not on the outcome, but on the intent of the act or acts. Genocide is not the same as extinction, which can take place without genocide. So genocide is very difficult to prove. Third, the law does not focus on the motive of the perpetrator. It requires only an intent to destroy, an intent to destroy a group as such, and it does not inquire into the perpetrator's reason for that intent. The perpetrator may have various motives, economic, territorial, ideological, racialist, but they're not relevant to guilt for genocide. However, the perpetrator must commit the acts with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. Yet, it is this part of the definition that is too narrow for many scholars of genocide, particularly sociological theorists who would wish the law to include and thus protect political groups and possibly even wider less distinct groups, such as socioeconomic classes, as potential victims of genocide. Many sociologists consider race to be a social construction, and racial groups to be just as much socially constructed as social classes or other social groups. But the legal definition of genocide protects only national, ethnical, racial or religious groups. A broader range of group-selective cases of mass killing 
falls under another legal definition, which I believe is not given enough emphasis in the fight to prevent or punish genocide. This is the one included in the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court as the crime of extermination, a separate crime, an older and separate legal term coming under the category of crimes against humanity. This one largely overlaps with most sociological definitions of genocide. Extermination is legally described as conduct that, quote, constituted or took place as part of a mass killing of members of a civilian population and was committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against a civilian population. Extermination is a crime against humanity, which includes not only massacres, but, like genocide, also covers, quote, the intentional infliction of conditions of life, inter alia, the deprivation of access to food and medicine, calculated to bring about the destruction of part of the population. Unquote. The UN sponsored Truth Commission for East Timor, which was largely funded by the Japanese government, by the way, found in, 19, in 2005 that Indonesian forces in East Timor had perpetrated, quote, extermination as a crime against humanity, unquote, in the period 1975 to 1999. Like genocide under the UN Convention, in the case of a crime against humanity, the intentionality of the crime is important. Though again, the purpose or motive of the extermination is not relevant to guilt. But unlike genocide, to meet the definition of extermination, the targeted population, or part of it, need not be an ethnic, national, racial, or religious group. And thus, this crime of extermination may cover political and social groups, like most sociological definitions of genocide. Nor do charges of crimes against humanity such as extermination, require proof, as the UN definition of genocide does, of what legal scholars call specific intent, that is, the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part as such. Such a high level of intent is not required for the crime of extermination, though it too is a crime committed intentionally, not accidentally, or without foreknowledge. That level of intentionality is still required, as is made clear by the deployment in the legal definition of extermination of the terms widespread or systematic, intentional, and calculated. So it's an intentional crime, but it doesn't require proof that specific intent that is, the intent to destroy a group as such, as genocide does. Extermination thus clearly covers most of those cases of genocide that are advanced by genocide scholars, but not covered by the UN Genocide Convention. For instance, the case of East Timor, where up to 150,000 people died or were killed by the Indonesian military occupation and repression. While other crimes against humanity, for instance, murder, which is a crime against humanity, uh, or apartheid is another, those crimes may be committed against individuals as well as groups. The crime of extermination emphasizes crimes against groups, collectivities, or communities. The legal definitions of genocide and extermination thus overlap with the definitions of sociologists such as Helen Fine, one of the leading sociologists of genocide. She writes, genocide is sustained purposeful action by a perpetrator to physically destroy a collectivity directly or indirectly, and if, in, and if indirectly is what she means, through interdiction of the biological and social reproduction 
of group members, sustained regardless of the surrender or lack of threat offered by the victim. So that's Helen Fine's definition of genocide. It doesn't refer to any specific type of group, ethnic or political, it could be any of them. A different definition, not, again, not a legal one, is that of Frank Chalk, who's a historian, and Kurt, jo Kurt Johnson, who's a sociologist. They write, genocide is a form of one-sided mass killing in which a state or other authority intends to destroy a group. As that group and membership in it are defined by the perpetrator. So here we have the possibility that the perpetrator can define the group, commit genocide against it, and again, it need not be any specific type of group except as defined by the perpetrator. So that's the major difference between Chalk and Jonathan uh, and Fine is that they include cases where the perpetrator defines the group's existence and proceeds to destroy people who the perpetrator claims belongs to this group, irrespective of what the victims feel about belonging to this group or not. Even if the victims are unaware of their ascribed membership in the group. Helen Fine disagrees with the inclusion of such imaginary groups, as she calls them, as genocide victims. Although those victims would surely qualify at least as victims of the crime against humanity of extermination. My major point here is that many of the borderline cases which have caused so much disputation among genocide scholars as whether a case is genocide or not, uh, people arguing about whether to call a certain case genocide. Many of these borderline cases could be resolved by giving as much attention to occurrences of the crime of extermination as to that of genocide. This is particularly true of Cambodia, even though it is also true, in my view, that cases of genocide have also been overlooked in Cambodia. But I would say that case, the case for extermination having taken place in Cambodia has also been understudied. Now, how much time have I got? Because I would like to, to take you have exactly as much time as you need. <laughs> so the Khmer Rouge regime that ruled Cambodia from 1975 to 79 committed not only several cases of genocide, but it also perpetrated the extermination of political and social groups and even of thousands of people that it classified into what were in fact imaginary groups, as would be defined by Chalk and Johnson. That is, groups that never believed they were constituted as groups. And I'm going to attempt to show you exactly how uh, the Khmer Rouge regime did this uh, by these uh, parts of uh, my, my talk. First, I'll look at the leadership of the democratic Kampuchea regime, the Pol Pot regime that ruled Cambodia from 75 to 79. And then we'll look at their ideology, and then who the victims were, and then I will try to explain exactly how these victims were targeted. I'll be using the recently released judgment was released in March of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Uh, they they uh, convicted Nguyen Chia and Kusapon of genocide last November, but they didn't release their full judgment, which runs to 2,259 pages uh, until, I think, March 28th uh, this year. When the Khmer Rouge took power, they forcibly emptied all of Cambodia's cities, along with its hospitals and Buddhist monasteries. They shut down the schools, newspapers, postal services, most of its factories. Uh, they dynamited... Right. Here is Cambodia in the map of Southeast Asia. I'm sure you don't need that. Uh, here is the ecological map of Cambodia. Uh, this is 
It's just a bit of historical background. I don't need to explain that to all of you here. <laughs> they dynamited the National Bank, the Khmer Rouge, when they took over. I took that picture in 1980. Uh, five years later, it still hadn't been repaired. These are all the sites where massacres took place, mass graves left behind by the Khmer Rouge. This is Pol Pot himself. Okay. They also abolished money, uh, and then January 1976, they proclaimed the new state of Democratic Cambodia, or DK, which became a vast agricultural labor camp because they expelled everybody from the cities to work without pay uh, in the countryside. Family life came under rigid controls, and soon Cambodians had to take their meals in collective mess halls. A 12-year-old peasant boy who I interviewed on the Thai border uh, in 1979, who'd been separated from his parents by the Khmer Rouge, told me that the Khmer Rouge were killing people every day. You can imagine the, how he learned that at the age of eight. However, most of the killings occurred in secret, like the administration of the entire country. This is Pol Pot, the country's new leader. He never admitted that his real name was Salat Sol. When he was a student in Paris in 1952, he chose a different name, the original Khmer, Khmer Da, which uh, emphasized the historic origin of the Khmer people, going right back to the past, what I call the cult of antiquity. Fellow Cambodian leftist students in Paris in the early 1950s had preferred less racial, more modernist code names like Free Khmer or Khmer Worker, but he wanted to be the original Khmer. Uh, and this prefigured his prejudice against other ethnic groups. His French scholarship ended after he failed his radioelectricity course two years in a row, and he returned back to Cambodia in 1953. But during the 1960s, he and other French-educated Cambodians, with the exception of Nguyen Chia, who was educated in Thailand at the law school in uh, Thammasat University in Bangkok, Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, Yang Sari, Houston Bond, Sun Sen, all educated in France or Thailand, took over the Communist Party that had fought the French for independence in the early 1950s. They took it over in the 1960s and took it in a much more radical uh, direction. And they set out on their path to power by staging an uprising in 1967 against Seattle's neutral monarchy. When General Lon Nol overthrew Seattle in March 1970, Prince Seattle took up exile in Beijing and he backed the people who had previously tried to overthrow him, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. In 1975, they defeated Long Nol's US-backed Khmer Republic and proclaimed their own state of democratic Cambodia uh, in 1976. Now, Pol Pot was the head of the ruling body, which was the standing committee of the Central Committee. That's it again. Standing committee of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Cambodia. But in actual practice, the leaders with the maximum national power and responsibility for the mass murders and genocides perpetrated from 75 to 79 were the leaders who were based in the capital, in Phnom Penh. It was this group that made up what was called the Chen Pak, the party center. They included Salat So, as you can see, Pol Pot, Long Rip, his real name, who became known as Nguyen Chia, uh, Yang Sari, number three, uh, and uh, Son Sen and, and others. Uh, Kyu Sun Pohan was also based in the capital. The others, that's them there, basically that's the party centre, uh, with Pol Pot on the far left. These people ran the show from Phnom Penh. 
other leaders who were more senior but, and older, uh, but not educated in France, were, had been trained by the Vietnamese communists. They held positions running the zones or the regions outside Phnom Penh. They didn't always get to Phnom Penh for the meetings of the standing committee of the Central Committee. And they were often excluded from those meetings. The real power was in the centre. These are some uh, of the other members of the standing committee. And these are the zones that the uh, Pol Pot regime uh, divided Cambodia into. Now there are, that's a, that's the, that was the Cambodian version, this is the English version. There are two very key zones, the southwest down there and the eastern zone. The most loyal zone to the Pol Pot Party Center was the southwest, led by a guy I mentioned before, Mok, who became the head of the army of the country, the commander-in-chief of the army. Uh, Mok ran the southwest zone, and we'll see that's going to be very important in for in how the actual genocide was committed. Uh, he was the closest, he ran the zone that was closest to Phnom Penh and politically closest to the party center and became the instrument, the southwest zone became the instrument for the genocide, for the party center's plans. In the eastern zone, uh, the leader was Sao Pen and the eastern zone was the uh, furthest ideologically from the party centre, although it too was close by, but in geographical terms close by, but ideologically least trusted. Uh, and Sao Pim, although he was a member of the standing committee, was not in the party centre. I've got the minutes of the first 17 meetings, and as far as I can recall, he attended like one. He was either not invited, or he was sick and having hospital treatment in China, uh, and he was virtually not included in any of the meetings. And in the end, uh, the party, uh, to cut a long story short, the party centre mobilised its own armed forces and the southwest zone armed forces and the northern zone armed forces and invaded the eastern zone and surrounded Salpin, the commander of the eastern zone, and when he was surrounded, he committed suicide. Uh, but then they tried to slaughter the entire population of the Eastern Zone, which is one and a half million. And they, in the last six months of the regime, this happened in May 78, the last year of the regime, in the last six months, they killed approximately two and a half, sorry, 250,000 ordinary Cambodians of the Eastern Zone. So here you get uh, to the question of whether it's possible to kill and commit a genocide against one's own people. Because these were people of the Khmer majority, 80% of the population of Cambodia are Khmer. This was called by some people, Jean Lacouture in France, called this auto-genocide, which is not a term that comes up in the international convention of a UN Convention on Genocide. Uh, it seems to me that it is covered because the Convention says, and it uh, acts committed with the intent to destroy uh, in whole or in part an ethnic, national, racial, religious, or national group. And it seems to me that killing 250,000 members of the Eastern Zone population is an intent to destroy part of a national group. And that seems to me that the lawyers could have made a case in the tribunal in Cambodia that this was a genocide and, uh, committed by the Pol Pot regime, including Nguyen Chia, who was the deputy leader of the regime. But they decided not to. They decided to go for the genocide against uh, racial 
and religious groups, the ethnic minority Vietnamese, ethnic Vietnamese minority, and the ethnic uh, Muslim charm minority. Although the numbers killed in those two cases were substantial in the tens of thousands, I would say 90,000 to 100,000 charms were killed, and uh, 10 to 20,000 ethnic Vietnamese. So these are substantial. They, in fact, they killed all of the ethnic Vietnamese remaining in the country. And it was impossible to find myself and Michael Vickery, another Cambodian scholar. We attempted to find a single ethnic Vietnamese who had survived the Pol Pot regime inside Cambodia. And neither he nor I nor anybody else has ever been able to find it case of a single survivor from the ethnic Vietnamese minority in Cambodia. A lot were deported, but all of those who remained after 1976 were tracked down uh, and killed. And this has been documented in the two and a half thousand page judgment of genocide against the ethnic Vietnamese. Uh, but it seems to me that the largest group of victims were the ethnic, sorry, the uh, Eastern Zone communities. Uh, much larger in number. And that's not even taking into account the political and social groups, the defeated officer corps of the Long Nol Army who were tracked down and killed in 1975 as soon as the regime took power. Uh, the uh, members of the intelligentsia, doctors were killed if they were found out to be doctors. You hear lots of stories about people being killed because they wore glasses. Sometimes that wasn't true, but a lot of times it was. The people who had any professional uh, qualifications were often killed because of their education or their learning. All kinds of people in certain uh, social groups who were tracked down and killed. Uh, so here we have uh, clear cases of extermination, crimes against humanity, and indeed Nguyen Chia and Houston Pollen were found guilty of extermination as a crime against humanity in 2014 and served, Houston uh, Bond still serving a life, life sentence for that. Nguyen Chia died in jail during his life sentence. Uh, and uh, Yang Sari was, uh, died during his trial for, for that. Uh, but there seems to be a, a gamut of cases and a gamut of charges, not just against the minority groups, but against the large population of, uh, of Cambodians. Uh, the, the national population of Cambodia in 1975 was 8 million, and uh, my estimate is that 1.7 million Cambodians died in less than four years, which is about 20% or a fifth of the population of Cambodia. It's probably the fastest and most destructive genocide. Although in a small country of 8 million, the proportion of genocide victims is higher uh, even than the Great Leap Forward in China, which technically wouldn't be a genocide, but uh, the toll was extremely high in the tens of millions. Uh, it's higher than anything uh, that uh, Stalin did, just leaving the comparison with other communist regimes. But if we compare it with the Nazi extermination of the Jews, it's certainly uh, rates very, very highly in comparison with that. Uh, and uh, the Rwandan genocide, we're talking about a three-month massive genocide of 800,000 to a million people. Uh, this is a million and 700,000 in, in four years. Uh, so this is an extremely rapid and, and I would say, deliberate uh, mobilization of mass killing, as well as enforced starvation, because the country was exporting rice at the time. It was taking rice grown by the people and exporting it, thereby leaving them to starve. And this was a regime that uh, organized the destruction of a fifth of its own people. I just want to finish up in a couple of minutes. This is Mock, the military commander, uh, who was promoted from chief of the Southwest Zone, although he kept that command and this 
South West Zone, but he also served as Commander in Chief of the Army of the Democratic Party. He died in 2006, just before the tribunal, but he died in jail. The government arrested him in 1999, and he spent seven years awaiting prosecution. Now, this is the prison tool slime where Duke, the commandant, uh, arrested and jailed and tortured and then murdered about 16,000 people. This is what happened to them. We took this picture in 1980 at what's now called the Killing Fields, but this was taken um, as the graves were being unearthed. I was the first Westerner to visit Chung Ak, as it was called then, the, the Killing Fields, where 63 mass grave pits were being unearthed. Uh, and this is the map we put together of the prisons, with, which are blue triangles, and the mass graves in white circles. And you can see how close they are to one another. The mass graves that have been unearthed are very close to the Khmer Rouge prisons, so we know what happened to the prisoners. Uh, here is Angkor Wat in Cambodia, the original Khmer, Pol Pot wanted to outdo the glory of Angkor in Cambodian history. Uh, Pol Pot, when he went to France as a young student to study radio electricity, uh, he got off the ship in Marseille, but he got on the ship in Saigon, and he got on the ship with another Cambodian called Meng Ma, and they came to Saigon from Cambodia, and May Man later told a Swiss friend of mine, uh, who was in the refugee camps on the Thai border in 1979, May Man was there, a Khmer Rouge official in Thailand. May Man told Tony Stadler that when they got to Saigon from Cambodia in 1949, they reached the uh, Saigon and they went to the market town, Chalun, the Chinatown, and they saw this bustling commercial district with you know, products on sale and people buying and selling. And he said, we felt like dark monkeys from the mountains. They felt an immediate uh, distance from this commercial world of lighter skinned people. Uh, so they, they got on the ship in Saigon and they got off in Marseille and they uh, then took the train from Marseille to Paris and they walked past this statue which is a, had been erected in the 1920s, this is in 1949 and it shows the French colonies of Asia and you can see the Cambodian movie, the Apsara on the left and on the right a Lao girl waiting on her and on the, in the centre a young Vietnamese boy waiting on her as well. This was French colonial ideology that, Cam that Cambodia, having been run by France for, for 90 years, was imagined by this French colonial artist as being the real jewel in the crown of French Indochina. And Cambodia was at the centre of it, and the Vietnamese and Lao were waiting. the message, not just from the statue, uh, but we know he walked past it, climbing the steps to the railway station. Uh, but French colonial ideology saw Cambodia as, as uh, a glorious place to be, whose glory needed to be preserved. And he said about doing that, he got a lot of it from French colonial thinking as well as from traditional Cambodian racism against the Vietnamese. Now this is another poster from World War II France, from fascist, fishy France, about agrarianism. This is my uh, calculation of the death tolls of 1.671 thousand people in the different categories. Uh, and this is the UN demographic expert from 2010, came up with similar figures. Vietnamese, ethnic Vietnamese in Cambodia had to carry ID cards 
and they're never given citizenship, very similar to the Tutsis in Rwanda. This is a document from the Pol Pot regime, the monthly report about screening out of UN Vietnamese elements, CIA agents, 1,100 Vietnamese people, small and big, young and old, have been smashed, contact, which means destroyed. July 1978. Uh, this is the death toll amongst Muslims that I was able to calculate in the 1980s. Just the leaders, the cultural elite of the Chan Muslim people. And uh, the names. What happened to them in the middle, the middle column, the cause of death. ones who had studied abroad, conducted the pilgrimage to Mecca and so on. What happened to them? Now these are the people from the southwest zone who were then sent to other zones to round up and kill the Chams in other zones, the Muslim Cham ethnic minority. Our aunt is in jail now, awaiting trial. Unfortunately, it doesn't look as if this trial will go ahead. The prosecutors have split. The Cambodian prosecutor is against it. The UN prosecutor is in favor. But the Hun Sen government is holding up the trial. But this was a man from the southwest zone who went to the northern zone. First, he conducted a census to find out where all the charms were, get all their names, enumerate all the charm families, and then having Completed the census, he had them all killed. Uh, the same with this man, did something very similar. This is Mock's son in law, also from the southwest. Uh, and Yun Tit, another case who, uh, which is being held up at the moment. Okay, so here is the eastern zone on the right, the southwest zone on the left. And sorry, I should explain. You see region 25 in the middle between the two. Uh, the, the party center took region 25 from the east and gave it to the southwest. Uh, at first gave it to the special zone, SZ, you see there. And then after they won the war against London, they gave Region 25 to the southwest zone. When they abolished the special zone, the war was over. They didn't give it back to the east, they gave it to the southwest. Uh, the center was favoring the southwest zone. They taken 25 from the east and then gave it to the southwest. And here's what happened in 1977, 76, 77 and 78. Military forces and political administrators was sent from the southwest to all those regions of the country. First, in 1976, to region 11 on the bottom left there, in 1977, to the northwest, and to the north, and to the central zone, and then in 1978, to the west, to the east, and to the northeast. And all this can be documented uh, voluminously. Southwest, under Mock uh, was the zone of, of a force, the military and political force that was used to take over all the other zones of the country and to conduct a census for all the minority groups and then to kill members of all the minority groups. And this is absolutely clear not only from the genocide judgment against Nguyen Chia and Kirsten Vaughan, published in March this year, but also from the prosecution's closing orders, one of the prosecutors, because they're split, of the cases against Ao An, Yim Tet, and Mia Mun. Those three cases are now being held up. We do have the prosecutor's closing orders, the indictments, and this is all uh, documented there. I also myself uh, interviewed 500 Cambodians in the early 80s and 
late 1970s who had survived the Pol Pot regime, including a number of uh, Khmer Rouge cadres who told me how this happened and what their uh, experience was. And when the Southwest Zone cadres came along to their zone, how the violence escalated. And this was the mechanism by which the genocide took place. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and this is the kind of conditions that people were living in. And you had a surplus of, uh, you know, lots of rainwater, garbage, and human sewage. So many times you're literally up to your knees in sewage. So you can imagine the smell and the the, the health conditions there are quite quite severe. This was my fixer, my guide who took me around. And this is a picture of the uh, security forces patrolling the camp to make sure nobody gets in and out. And this was a site of some mass graves. This grave, for example, was of a family of about seven or eight people who were burnt alive in their homes. And the security forces put all the remains in the back of a pickup truck and dumped them in front of the camp. So the camp residents took them in and buried them in this mass grave. So how did this all come to pass? How did the Rohingya become the most persecuted minority in the world? So Myanmar is a country, as you can see there, not too far from Cambodia, which you've just heard of, Thailand, Laos, Southeast Asia, about 50 million people. The majority of the population are Burmar Buddhists, about 80%. The other largest, next largest minority are Muslims, which constitute about 5%. Then they're made up of Christians, Hindus, and Sikhs and other kind of minorities. The majority of Rohingya population is situated in this region here, in the Rakhine region, the capital of Sikhwe. So the main accusation that is made against Rohingya is this right here. Is that this term Rohingya is a manufactured term, that these people are all essentially illegal immigrants that came over from Bangladesh and they made up this word called Rohingya to give them an identity, to give themselves a, a label which attaches them to the land, this land known as Rohan in the past. And this is the main accusation. And some uh, Buddhist elements uh, you know, actually go much further. They actually even put a date on it. Some of them will say, well, this term Rohingya was manufactured in 1952, in March 1952, and before that time, this term didn't exist. So they all came over from Bangladesh in 1952, made up this term and they basically gave themselves an identity. They're all illegal immigrants from Bangladesh and they should all just go back to Bangladesh. So one of the things I try to do in my book is to try to ascertain the veracity of these, of these claims. And I dug up documents on the Indian National Archive in the UK and as well as other documents which, are, which you can see here in some of the dates going back to 1811. And uh, you can see the terms used there quite clearly, Rohingya. And this is a, a document from the, from the British Colonial Office, uh, a civil servant called Charles Patton, in 1826. One thing that the British were extremely efficient at, you know, you realize why there was a point in which they ruled almost half the world's population, and, uh, is that they were extremely efficient at uh, research and categorizing people. So before the armies actually went in, before the military would actually colonize a region, they would send in these civil servants to the colonial office who would then study the power structures, who would study the languages, who would study the tribes, etc. and make a very clear map. And these are places that are not mapped at all in terms of how the society in this region operates. And then they would, before, they would actually go in and then colonize this region. So even Charles Patton report mentions um, uh, the Rohingya criteria and how one in three souls in this region are Muslim Sardars of Rohingya origin. So how did this all actually come about? For that we need to take a step back in history. We need to take a step back to the Second World War when the Japanese invaded what was at that time British Burma. It was a British colony. The majority Buddhist population sided with the Japanese invaders believing that the Japanese are going to be victorious and this is going to lead to swifter independence from the British colonial masters. Whereas the minority Rohingya population stayed loyal to the British at that time. So when the country did become independent in 1948, there was bad blood between the two people. The Rohingya were seen as having not supported the Buddhists during their struggle against the yoke of colonialism. And uh, they were seen as the first colonists who were simply not loyal to the British, uh, to, the, to, to the Burmese majority. But despite that, there was relative calm up until 1962 when there was a military coup with the army chief, General Nay Win. General Nay Win took power and he tried to implement what he called the Burmese Road to Socialism, which was a communist manifesto and it was a complete 
economic disaster. So he did what a lot of military dictators do in that situation when things start to go wrong, is that they start to look for scapegoats, scapegoats on whom to bring all the ills of society on. And the Rohingya minority, who were already looked at with suspicion, who were already seen as fifth colonists, who had a different language, a different skin colour, different features, different religion, they were the perfect minority for such scapegoating. General Newman also became much more overtly Buddhist in his outlook. He started wearing the Buddhist religious garb. He started making statements such as only Buddhists can be loyal citizens of this country, and anybody who is non-Buddhist could never possibly be uh, loyal to Myanmar, to, to Burma at that time. So he passed a number of laws which eventually culminated in the 1982 Citizenship Act, which stripped the majority of the Rohingya of the nationality, making them some of the largest stateless people around the globe. In 1988, there was an uprising against the regime, and General Nehru was forced out of office. But despite him being forced out of office, the regime still stayed intact. The military junta still retained power, and the military junta then became much more ethnocentric and much more overtly extreme Buddhist in their outlook in terms of trying to define a Buddhist uh, identity, extreme Buddhist identity. And this led to a number of massacres which culminated in the 2012-2013 massacre when the Rakhine movement was uh, raped. Then a number of Rakhine stopped a bus of Rohingya and, uh, and murdered the people of the Rohingya on the bus. And this was exacerbated by individuals such as this, who I'll come on to shortly, Ashin Wirastu, who described himself as the Buddhist Bin Laden. Very strange, very strange character in terms of his outlook, not the traditional kind of Buddhist that we would normally think of. And this individual here, Dr. A. Wong, who's currently in prison, not for uh, inciting genocide against Rohingya, but for insulting Aung San Suu Kyi, which is, his, which is the bigger crime. Uh, according to many Burmese. But his name was the most common name that came up when I went to the camps. Is that who was instigating the violence? Dr. Amon was one of the most names that came up most often. He and his gang of followers, essentially, and he was a leader of one of the political parties in the Rakhine, where it went around restaurants and public places to make sure that no Rohingya would ever intermingle with the locals. So whenever there was a Rohingya sitting with a, uh, a Rakhine Buddhist in the restaurant or in a public setting, they would send their mobs out to essentially beat them up and, and harass them. So I wrote this piece in the public post at that time, who was instigating the majority of the violence against the Rohingya. So the aftermath of this the, the massacre in 2012-2013 was a huge exodus of hundreds of thousands of Rohingya into Bangladesh, into these oversized, into these uh, overcrowded camps. This was the only means of escape, is by land, into these camps, or by these kind of rickety boats into other regions where they usually were sold into the slave trade in Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and other countries particularly into the Croan, the ship's slave trade in, uh, 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 on ships. So one of the key questions I get asked most often is that if I am arguing that this has been going on since the Second World War, this kind of discrimination, this kind of uh, persecution, why did it happen on such a scale in 2017? Why did it really explode onto the world scene in 2017? The answer to that is that when you study genocides, it is quite common for the perpetrator of a genocide, for the organizers, the architects of the genocide, to undertake a dry run, to undertake a test run, to see what is going to be the reaction of the international community, what is going to be the reaction of local actors. Are we able to get away with this? Are we able to take this to the next level? Are we able to execute the final solution and essentially wipe out these people. The, the military in Myanmar decided to undertake a dry run in 2016 when the military group called Barsa, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, undertook an attack on a, a few security outposts, which left about a dozen security officials dead. In response, 
almost a military invaded a number of villages. And this, this was all documented by Human Rights Watch, who took these satellite images. This was the village of Niapat, for example. This was a picture before, and this was an after. This was another Rohingya village. This was a before, and this was an after. The villages were essentially completely destroyed. They were burnt to the ground, <coughs> and over 150,000 Rohingya were expelled into Bangladesh, and approximately 10 to 15,000 were murdered. These are just some of the images of after. When this happened, it was quite interesting because the same individual actually went after you made the statement when after Donald Trump was elected that Donald Trump is very similar to me in terms of in, uh, in, in terms of uh, tacting illegal immigration into the country. Dr. A. Mong even wrote a letter to Donald Trump saying that uh, we look forward to working together with you. And I wrote this piece in Newsweek about how the Rohingya genocide had actually begun. So after this exercise in 2016, the military had three very important lessons, which then they decided that when it came to 2017, that look, we can actually take this up a couple of notches. The first thing that they learned was that Aung San Suu Kyi, the civilian leader, defends the military in public. Aung San Suu Kyi became a defender and became a shield for all criticism against the military in the public domain. For example, when the BBC's Fair Go Keen, journalist Fair Go Keen said to her, there is ethnic cleansing going on in your country, she said ethnic cleansing is far too strong a term for what is happening. Both sides are equally to blame to drawing a moral equivalence between the aggressor and the victim. When uh, the United Nations in March 2017 produced a report saying that 52% of Rohingya women that made it to the camps in Bangladesh had been raped, so the majority of them had been raped, she said, this is fake rape. That was her words on her Facebook page, which she diffused with press uh, by the BBC to, to take back. And I fully appreciate that Aung San Suu Kyi does not control the military, but she does control the, the visas in her country. And when the UN passed a resolution in Mar also in March 2017 for a full scale Human Rights Commission inquiry, she said this will not be very helpful and she refused to give the UN access to Myanmar, where the UN still do not have any access at all. So that's the first thing that the military learned. Very important lesson is that the most famous citizen of Myanmar is a shield against all criticism against the military in the public domain. The second thing that they learned is that despite all the evidence of ethnic cleansing, of genocide, of mass graves, of graves, etc., the European Union literally still ruled out a dead carpet for, uh, for the military chief, General Minong Ming. Austria and Germany gave him a, a VIP guided tour of the armaments factories to, so that he can replenish his military. And I wrote to both of their ambassadors, and I, they didn't respond, so I published the letter once again online to ensure that it remains in the public domain, and in which I warned them that this region is now being militarized, and the military is now preparing for a final offensive against this minority group. So that's the second thing that they learned, is that despite all the evidence of genocide, that uh, <coughs> the military chiefs could still travel around the globe openly and there's absolutely no criticism of their actions whatsoever. The third thing that they learned, the third lesson, is that the military in Myanmar was very, very unpopular, which is what forced them to have elections in the first place. The military was seen as being corrupt and out of touch. But then after this exercise against the Rohingya, the military suddenly became very popular. They were seen as the defenders of Buddhist values against these invading Muslim hordes from Bangladesh. So the military led these three critical exercises after the 2016 operation and decided in 2017 that they could really take this up a couple of notches and uh, execute the final solution to get rid of all the Rohingya from their country once and for all, which is precisely what they did. Now one of the questions I get asked most often is about the role of Buddhism. Now surely Buddhists cannot be involved in something of this kind of nature. You know, Buddhists are individuals who 
even when they, they don't even step on insects, and even when you have bad thoughts, you need to cleanse yourself. But the form of Buddhism that they follow in Myanmar is not necessarily the Buddhism that you and I may be familiar with. It is not the Buddhism of, of the Dalai Lama or the Buddhism of these celebrities in Hollywood. In fact, many of them don't even recognize the Dalai Lama. They think that he is just a, he, he is, he, he is essentially just a con man. And when he visited Myanmar, there was protests from other Buddhist groups against, against the, the Dalai Lama. The form of Buddhism that they follow is known as Theravada Buddhism, which can be, not always, but which can be very militant in its nature. And you only have to look at some of the sermons of some of the leading Buddhists, uh, some, some of the leading Buddhist uh, personalities from Myanmar. The sermons are online on YouTube, in which they openly advocate the killing of minorities. One of the chief Buddhists, one of the Buddhist leaders in, uh, in Myanmar, he gave a, 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 a presentation to a group of army officers. So after the 1988 revolution, the military realized that we need to have a much better relationship with the Buddhist clergy. So they, they appointed a, cler a cleric, a Buddhist cleric, to every single regiment. So it becomes like a patron for that particular regiment. And there's a video of him, his name's uh, Sitago. He's, he's sitting on a big chair, almost like a throne. And all these military officers are sitting on the floor. And he's giving a sermon in which he's telling them how the story of a king, an ancient king of, uh, of, uh, of Burma, who was very troubled and could not sleep at night because he had killed a few people. And the Buddhist clergy, the local town, realized that the king was disturbed because they had these special uh, inclinations. So they went to the king in the middle of the night and they told him that, look, we know that you can't sleep and you're disturbed because you, you killed these people, but you have nothing to worry about because those people were not Buddhists, so they were only half human. So this is the implication of this to of army officer is very clear that look, non-Buddhists are only half human. And many of them believe that the Rohingya, you can hear some of the other experiments from individuals like him, that the Rohingya have actually been reincarnated from snakes and insects. So when you do kill them, you're not actually killing humans at all, you're just killing vermin. So another key question that I get asked very often is the role of the international community. You know, why has the international community, you know, we have repeatedly said, never again, never again, and now we are saying, yet again, this is happening. You know, why is this happening now, and why um, uh, has the international community been so benign in this response? And I believe that there's three reasons for that as well. Three principal reasons, multiple reasons, but three principal reasons. First of all, the Rohingya, when you actually come across them, they were right, one thing we realize is that they were right at the bottom of the ladder. There's hardly anybody amongst them with even a basic college education. I've, I've, I've spoken about this topic to many audiences, and one of the things I always say to them, you know, I'm, uh, is that when you've come here to hear about the Rohingya, so you're obviously interested in the topic, yeah? but I beg you, not a single one of you can name me a single Rohingya person anywhere in the world. And most of the time, nobody ever can. Because there are no Rohingya and uh, you know, famous Rohingya celebrities. There are no Rohingya, uh, nobody of Rohingya origin working at the BBC or Al Jazeera or CNN that can take this up as a pet project to raise awareness for the people. There's nobody of Rohingya origin in Silicon Valley that's made, you know, Few, few million dollars, I can say I'm going to put five million dollars of my money in a public awareness campaign for my people. There's no way of going to origin elected to the British Parliament or the European Parliament or anything else. These people literally are right at the bottom of the ladder. They have been the farmers, fishermen, rickshaw pullers, and laborers. This is the main profession. And throughout the decades, there's been a systematic campaign by the Burmese authorities to ensure that they are completely disenfranchised and do not have access to, uh, to education. So there was an incident in which a Rohingya woman was killed in one of the camps, and there was big news because she was the only one with a college education in, the, you know, in, that, in that facility. So it became quite big news. So this is one of the reasons I believe that these famous people simply cannot advocate for themselves locally, let alone internationally. And I know most of the Rohingya organizations that are operating in this space around the globe, and they're quite rudimentary, just one or two people with a, with a fax machine. Most of them don't even know how to put together a press release. 
So there's not really much advocacy for them. The second reason I believe is that that there's a myth, and I, I met policymakers around the globe on this topic in the UK and here in Washington and uh, even in Europe. And there's a myth surrounding Aung San Suu Kyi that look, Aung San Suu Kyi, Myanmar is the honor journey. It's a flawed democracy. It's a democracy nevertheless. It's moving in the right direction. We understand there's lots of complications. But the last thing we want to do is to put too much pressure on Aung San Suu Kyi and the government in case the military then comes back again and takes power. And nobody wants that. Certainly there's lots of issues, but it's a flawed democracy with a democracy that's moving in the right direction. We want to keep it encouraging that. And I believe this is a myth. And this is a myth being supported by Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, her supporters in the West. Uh, the reality is that the military in Myanmar is actually in a perfect situation at the moment. They have the holy grail of politics. They have power without any accountability. You know, they can at the moment get on with all the killing and enriching themselves dramatically. Many of them have become extremely wealthy through the jade trade. They have huge holdings in Macau and Singapore, uh, which you know many people in the UN are fully aware of. The last thing they want to do is to take back power and then invite international sanctions and international score against them. Right now they're in the perfect position. Let Aung San Suu Kyi to become a lightning rod of criticism. You know, let her defend the, public, the military and public whilst they go on with their ethnic cleansing policies and enriching themselves. This is, I believe, the second reason I have met multiple policy makers who have continuously told me this, that we can't put too much pressure on, on Myanmar. And the third reason I believe is, is geopolitical. When President Obama was in office, he visited Myanmar on two occasions. And for any country to get a visit from the President of the United States, it's a very big deal for that country. And why would Obama visit on two occasions? Why would the US President visit on two occasions? The United States is concerned that as Myanmar opens up, and this, this was one of the most suspicious, one of the most closed societies in the world, almost like North Korea, they are concerned that as it opens up, it is falling within the sphere of influence of China. China is essentially the entire Southeast Asia is now being redeveloped through the Belt and Road Initiative for one purpose, and that was to meet China's insatiable demand for resources. They have, they have invested tens of billions of dollars throughout this whole region in countries like Pakistan, a country that nobody wanted to touch with a barge pole. They've invested over $62 billion to the CPAC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So the United States is concerned that Myanmar is just another country that will open up and then it will essentially become part of the Chinese sphere of influence. China, on the other hand, wants access to Myanmar because China has ambitions to be a global superpower. They believe that this is their destiny. But before they can become a global superpower, it must become a regional power. And that means keeping its regional nuclear rival India in check. Access to Myanmar gives access to the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean, and they can avoid the states of Manaka. So you have these geopolitical machinations going on between nuclear superpowers, US, China, India, and then you, invent, then you insert this minority group called the Rohingya, who nobody's ever heard of. You insert that into the equation, it simply does not fit into that larger, long-term calculation. So I believe that's the third reason why there's been very little inaction from the West, from the international community, because there's been much larger geopolitical strategic thinking going on. Another key question is the role of Aung San Suu Kyi, and this has seemed to have baffled a lot of people, is that why has there been such silence from Aung San Suu Kyi in this situation? You know, why has she become this great, great Nobel laureate, this great hope of the world? Why has she been completely silent and in some cases many would argue complicit in this entire, in this entire uh, enterprise? And uh, I believe this is much more to do with us than it is to do with her. So I believe that we in the West, we have a need to have our heroes on a pedestal. We have to have our heroes on a pedestal and we have to have them untarnished. Nobody wants to hear about the shortcomings of Dr. King and his philandering. 
Nobody wants to hear the shortcomings of Mother Teresa or, or anybody else. We need, to, we need to have our heroes are totally pure. And her story is one of the best stories that you'll ever come across. You know, she's the daughter of one of the founding generals of Myanmar. She was placed under house arrest by her father's former colleagues. She's beautiful, she's articulate, she's an Oxford graduate, she speaks the Queen's English, she has a Nobel Prize, now she's out of prison, and she's opening up her country to democracy and free markets. This is fantastic. We love this kind of stuff. We, we need movies out of this kind of stuff. You know, she come, she's come to the West, and she's tasted our democracy, and she's going to go back to her country now, her own backward country, and she's going to turn her backward country into our country with our values. So we love this stuff. And then we overlook many of her ideas many of the ideologies that these people actually know. And we have made this mistake on multiple occasions, not just with her. If you look back and you think of, uh, even in most recent cases of Bashar al-Assad, the London-trained ophthalmologist who has been quoted by Tony Blair as the great reformer, now he's turned out to be one of the greatest mass murderers of our time. Look at Simon Gaddafi, PhD from the London School of Economics, going to be the change that Libya needs, exactly the same threatening genocide on its people. Or probably the best example is Kim Jong-un, you know, educated at a boarding school. He loves Disneyland, he loves basketball, and now he's threatening us with nuclear annihilation. So we make this mistake over and over again. We think people have come to the West, they've tasted our democracy, our way of life, and they're going to turn their own backward country into our country with our values, with our system, without realizing that these people are actually elite in their society. And coming to Georgetown or Oxford or anywhere else makes them the elite of the elite. And in many occasions, to be fair to them, is that they have no choice. You know, they are either in power or they're going to be dead. So they have to do with an iron fist. And she's a classic example of this. I wrote a piece in Newsweek uh, last year. It was called How We Were Seduced by Aung San Suu Kyi. And in that piece, I interviewed half a dozen people who had known her intimately for decades. Amongst them was the founder of the Free Aung San Suu Kyi campaign. Also, an individual who used to smuggle papers to her in prison a huge risk to himself. And then there was an Australian member of parliament who was the first Westerner to meet with her after she was released from house arrest. And then he and Aung San Suu Kyi became good friends. All of them told me on the record, and I published in this in the Newsweek piece that I wrote, is that Aung San Suu Kyi is a racist, and she has always been a racist. The fact is, we just chose to ignore it because it fits with our narrative of what we want our heroes to be like. She has written some, some of our early writings. She wrote a pamphlet about her father, about uh, General Aung San. And it states quite clearly is that um, uh, we are proud Buddhist nationalists, not like those Kalar. And Kalar is a term in the US, you would say, is the equivalent of an N word. And it was all there in the 1984, it was all there in black and white. Another individual who founded the Free Aung San Suu Kyi camp and told me that, you know, they had the uh, a woman from one of the backgrounds, she was a student in London from Kashin background, who would translate some of the press releases for them. And when she found out Aung San Suu Kyi, she said, I, she was like, never want that girl to ever touch my stuff. And he said, well, look, we don't have many translators that are willing to do this for me. So she said, I don't care. The implication was that these people are unclean. I don't want them ever to touch any of my things. The interesting thing is that when Aung San Suu Kyi came to in the United States, you know, she pleaded with President Obama, and Obama decided to lift all sanctions of Myanmar without any conditions at all. But the interesting thing is, is that Obama was not the only leader that she met when she was in the United States. She also met with congressional leadership, Senate leadership, and so on, and she was brought in as, as this great as this great reformer and savior. She also met with the Senate Majority Leader, Senator Bob Corker, and he very uncharacteristically, a Republican senator made the statement that he was absolutely shocked at a complete dismissiveness when he mentioned human rights abuses, sexual violence, and sexual trafficking in our country. And this is a, and this was before the current crisis, 
And this is, this is quite characteristic of a number of people that have actually met with her, is that if you mention any of these issues to her, of any sort of persecution, human rights issues of minorities, is that she goes into, she becomes completely outraged. And a number of people who are leaders of some of the biggest NGOs that have met with her, people that campaigned for her, including members of Congress and Senate who met with her, all of them told me exactly the same thing. As soon as you mention anything to her about why are these issues, she just gets completely outraged that why are you bringing this up? Where are you getting this information from? And how dare you say these things in front of me? So the question is, is that what's happening now to the Rohingya? You know, what's the future for the Rohingya? The unfortunate reality is, is that the Rohingya are now occupying what is the largest refugee camp in the world. Now you need to a number of refugee camps are in the globe, including in Syria, Turkey, Jordan, and so on. None of them are ready, none of them are pleasant, but I've never seen anything like this, and this is not just my interpretation. You can literally find the highest hill and look around you, and all you see over the horizon is a sea of humanity living in mud and squalor. Estimates are up to 1.4 million people are living in this condition, and they have absolutely no hope of going back. There's absolutely no reason why Myanmar is going to take them back. There's no pressure on Myanmar whatsoever. Uh, Myanmar is essentially, uh, by all means and purposes, going away with this. Now the challenge we have is that now that they have gone away with this, they are turning their attention to other minorities. And I wrote a piece on this in foreign policy, which was called First They Came for the Wrong Job. Because what happens is that once you open the door to one genocide and you allow one genocide to go unpunished, it opens the door to many others. And now that they have finished with the Rohingya, the Myanmar authorities, the Myanmar military, the Kathmandu, is turning its attention to other minorities, the Kashin, the Karen, the Shan, and the same divisions that were deployed to persecute the Rohingya, to target the Rohingya, the known as Division 33 and 99, also known as the tip of the spear, they are now deployed to uh, trip the country of these other minorities. This is a country that has been at civil war with almost every one of its minorities since independence. These are the longest running civil wars in the world, and the military will not rest until they create a pure or marvelous nationalist state, which is the ambition of many of the elite in, in, in Myanmar. So I'll, I'll leave that there. Thank you so much for listening.